Nice to meet you. Welcome to the Naval Base. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Our primary output, of course, is the defence of the country, but there's no requirement for us to compromise that. We don't need to give up some of that military capability and commitment. We need to adopt and bring the low carbon technologies into the way we do our business. Commodore JJ Bailey took command of Portsmouth Naval Base in 2019. This is home to two thirds of the UK's surface fleet. And this site, plus the naval bases at Devonport and Fas Lane, also consume more energy than any other part of defence. Here on the Solent, they're trying to change that, attacking their carbon footprint on every front, with the aim of making this huge base net zero by 2040. We have a really good history over the last 10 years or so of what I would describe as a cost-led reduction, particularly around our energy consumption in the base. Uh, and uh, when I arrived a couple of years ago, uh, I began to change that so that we thought about carbon as part of that dynamic. And that has allowed us really to uh, think forwards about the sorts of things that we might adopt and the technologies we can bring into play in order to reduce both our cost and our carbon impact going forwards. According to MOD figures, Portsmouth emits just over 31,000 tonnes of carbon a year. That's around 3% of the entire defence estate emissions and about a third of the CO2 that London produced in a day before the pandemic. But the Navy has made great strides in decarbonising here. CO2 emissions are now a third of what they were in 2003 and at the same time the base's energy use has been cut in half. One of the drivers for this change has been the Royal Navy's new aircraft carriers. Their arrival here in Portsmouth doubled the base's use of electricity. In fact, they used so much power that the national grid on Portsea Island wouldn't be able to cope. They needed to find a way to be self-sustaining. The answer was to build a new 13 megawatt combined heat and power plant, capable of producing enough electricity to fully power the base, with the added bonus of supplying heat as well. Ian Greenleaf joined the Royal Navy at the age of 15. He served as a warfare officer and in 2005 became captain of Portsmouth Naval Base. Now he's the engineer leading the charge to turn this place green. So, so we've been clearly on, a, uh, on an, a carbon journey for a long time. We first went to market for a plant like this at the back end of the noughties uh, and uh, that particular programme uh, collapsed at the start of the last recession and so we revisited it for the for the for the carriers and uh, we were very conscious that uh, as as a large energy consumer uh, if we did nothing about it there was a large bill uh, coming our way uh, and uh, trying to address both the bill and the carbon footprint was a core part of the design challenge for this machine. Okay. The three generators are powered by mains gas and sit alongside Portsmouth's rather ancient electricity and steam system. As well as reducing emissions, they also save money, around £4 million a year, cash that's being reinvested in other green technology here. And you talk about hydrogen, obviously these are still burning essentially fossil fuels now, but down the line... So we've we, we just completed a feasibility study in putting a large-scale hydrogen plant on, taking seawater, breaking it into oxygen, which becomes a bottled and becomes a, a, a sellable product, uh, and hydrogen, which we can then use to mix with our mains gas. Uh, at the moment, technology is suggesting you can get about 20% mix without reducing the efficiency of the machine. That will take 20% out of the residual carbon of the base, and these become not only very efficient, but they also become productive in terms of that carbon journey. Next door in the old plant room, they take the heat produced by those new generators and reuse it. Two heat exchangers. And explain to me what a heat exchanger is to the uninitiated. What so, is that? So, so it, it takes uh, energy out of the machine, the heat energy comes out of the machine, and it, it used to feed uh, the water that goes into the boilers at the far end. And instead of taking the water off the mains at, at, at a coldish temperature, it heats it right up so that the boilers have to do less work to generate the steam because it's already preheated. There's been a naval dockyard in Portsmouth since the 12th century and as well as greening the ageing infrastructure here, they're also trying to make this whole port more environmentally friendly. Tucked away behind the industrial facade is a hidden world of listed buildings and beautiful green spaces, all of which former soldier Ronnie Harley and his team are working to enhance. Well, obviously the, um, the naval base, you know, historically has kicked out a heck of a lot of uh, CO2 uh, and other atmospheric pollutants. So it's, as I said before, it's finding these spaces that's sympathetic uh, to the naval base's, you know, existence, which is operational support, and then just 
interweaving that like a vine, you know, through the tapas to the naval base to produce these species, which will pull in some of that extra carbon. Helping Ronnie is Rebecca Delaney. She's working across the 380-acre site, bringing some of its disused corners back to life. We've got this sort of coastal environment. You can yeah. build some coastal gardens. Yeah, we've got um, some unused gravel area right over by a tra uh, Trafalgar Gate and by Unicorn Gate. So they're like quite focal points as you enter the yeah. site. So it would be really nice to make them um, a coastal garden, you know, incorporate our geography. Just across the water from the naval base is Whale Island, built in 1885 on mud reclaimed from the building of the dockyard. It served as a gunnery school. Nowadays, HMS Excellent, as it's called, is home to the Royal Navy's headquarters. It's also a thriving conservation area with a flourishing habitat of plants and wildlife. Rather than mowing every lawn here with military precision, they're letting certain areas grow, encouraging nature to take over. Ian McFall served 23 years in the Navy. Now he's doing what he loves, protecting this unique area, including some of its busiest occupants. Okay, Simon, if you'd like okay. to put a bee suit on okay. and a pair of gloves. Just make over my head like a, like a smock. That's the baby. This is going to protect me, is it? You pro you're promising you from, me this. from the bees. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about these, these bees. They give you some fantastic honey. Oh, the, the honey is absolutely glorious. Like I say, shop-bought honey is, is, is adulterated and, and made to make us taste what we think we want to taste. This is as pure as you can get it, and it's got so many flavours to it. It's untrue. Uh, the, the colony sits in here for about four years before the queen needs requeening. Uh, annually you, you manage your bees and inspect them and then once a year normally you can sometimes do a double harvest but I tend to do the one harvest in August and then spin the honey off and bottle it up. So when you come to uh, harvest the honey you get a really hot knife and you cut the top cappings off both sides. You pop four frames into this little spinner, you spin your handle and centrifugal force spins all the honey out of the frames. You turn them around do the same again and then at the bottom comes the amber nectar tastes like honey, proper honey. So what else are they doing here? Well, they've installed solar panels on some buildings, including the base's new car park canopies, and they're fitting these turbines to turn the coastal wind into kilowatts. We've got three uh, wind turbines that were installed back in June. Each of those produces about 15 kilowatts uh, of, of energy. On a normal day, when there's a, with a bit more wind, they would be uh, spinning a lot more than they are today. Uh, and they are really just for us to understand the efficiency and, and what we can, uh, we can get from, from that technology. As an operational base, there are restrictions on what we can do in terms of spinning, um, spinning rotors. Um, but we are looking at where we might scale up to uh, turbines, maybe up to a, a maximum height of 50 metres. Uh, and what that might achieve and what that might reduce in terms of uh, energy generation and uh, carbon reduction. Like most defence establishments, Portsmouth now has a fleet of electric vehicles, 46 in total. Commodore Bailey took us for a tour in one of them and explained what else is planned here. And just in front of us here actually is the final bit of the carrier infrastructure that's going in. So you might imagine as the carriers arrive, the size and scale of the vessels means that we surge quite a lot of people and materiel into the base in order to yeah. deliver uh, really intense uh, maintenance packages. Uh, and we've got a final piece which is a forward logistics centre that allows us to kit uh, all of the spares that we need in order to deliver that maintenance package in a really efficient and productive way. We looked at how we could reduce the energy impact of this, mm -hmm. and so this is going to be our first net zero carbon building on the site. A lot of the uh, uh, systems internally are, will be electric, uh, energy storage built into the building, uh, low, low energy consumption lighting, uh, and then a PV array, a, a solar array across the roof, which actually enables us to make sure that everything that's done within that building is powered from within the building itself overall. The UK set ambitious targets on carbon reduction, aiming to cut emissions by 68% by the end of this decade before reaching net zero in 2050. The targets are legally binding and the armed forces, just like every other business and organisation, is now in a race to decarbonise. But of course for the Royal Navy that presents a huge challenge. If Britain is indeed to become global, then that will require huge fossil fueled ships like the Prince of Wales carrier travelling to far-flung places around the world. It'll need huge bases like the one here in Portsmouth and an ambitious shipbuilding programme. All of which of course do nothing to reduce the Navy's carbon footprint. So how does it square that circle? How does it do all those things and still go green? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd see it more as an opportunity than, than a constraint. And I think 
Um, we, sustainability has always been the heart of what we do, we've done. I think the difference now is that it really is at the fundamental core of all our business and that we need to drive that forward in order to deliver operational advantage. You know, we've always prided ourselves of being a global, modern and ready Navy. And I think in the 21st century, all of those mean sustainable. You know, as you say, you know, to be global, not only as a reference Navy do we need to set the standard for others, but I think as we change where we operate, you know, in the Arctic or in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, which we'll be routinely operating in the future, those are all areas really at the front, forefront of the areas most affected by climate change. So it's really important that our platforms, whether they're ships, submarines or aircraft, and our people are ready to operate in those environments. I think in the modern space that we talk about, the people that join, the young men and women that join the Navy today, they expect us to play our part in that climate change. And they expect us to ensure that the use of the resource, the finite resource of the earth, is the most effective that we can take. And I think then, finally, on the ready space, I mean, as you've said, as climate change affects the world, our platforms and our people have got to be adapted to be able to operate that. That's how I see the sort of focus of the future, and that's where I think I see the opportunity for us. Of course, encouraging its people to buy into the Navy's green transformation is part of the challenge, but here in Portsmouth, they're leading the way. They've already reduced emissions by 70%, and they know the remaining 30 will be the hardest to find, but they're confident they can do it, taking this hugely historic naval base towards the goal of net zero. Simon Newton, Forces News, Portsmouth. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.